church family it's good to be with you on this Easter Sunday we have a lot to celebrate because Jesus Christ did not stay in the tomb he conquered death by rising from the dead on Easter Sunday and because of that we have been given the opportunity to know Jesus Christ personally and have our sins forgiven so that we can be right with God not only today but forever and as part of that we get to exp spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ, which means even though we will die here on earth, we will always live in Jesus Christ. Today, I want to present to you two Easter stories. The first one you've most definitely heard. In fact, you probably read it many, many times. The second Easter story, perhaps you've never heard before. And I want to start with that second story. In 2005, my family and I moved to Pasadena, California so that I could go to seminary. The first year that we were there, we got to experience the Rose Parade, which takes place on January 1st every year, uh, for the first time. And it was the first time uh, that it had rained in over 50 years during the Rose Parade. And so it was kind of a miserable experience. We had two small children at the time and taking them out in the rain. We basically hung out under the eaves of some of the storefronts so that we didn't get completely drenched. But it was still a, an incredible experience to see these floats up close and in person. I must admit that I'm not much of a parade person. I, I don't like big crowds, and uh, that wouldn't be my first choice to go to a parade. And yet, since we lived only a block and a half away from the Rose Parade route, we went at the urging of some of our friends. And when you actually see those floats up close, and they, they're all made from natural material, flowers and, and, and petals of flowers, bark and nuts and all kinds of natural things, and, and how big many of them are, you come to realize how creative people actually are. And you get to see that um, each unique float represents something personal to the uh, group or, or the city or the organization that it, it represents. Well, the next year, I had a whole new experience because it was dry on January 1st. And so at the tip, uh, at a, uh, taking a tip from a friend of mine, if you want a front row seat at the Rose Parade, you have to sleep out overnight on the sidewalk. And that is a cultural experience, not only because of the di diversity of people that live in that area, but also because of all the things that you get to take in. For instance, uh, in the late afternoon and early evening, the night before the Rose Parade, all kinds of vehicles are driving up and down the, the Rose Parade route. Everything from old classic vehicles to trucks that are jacked up, um, impossibly high to uh, sports cars including Lamborghinis. It is quite an interesting uh, time. And then as it gets dark, the nicer vehicles get off the road 
And then there are people just driving up and down the strip, uh, calling out to people on the street. A lot of people on the street have their televisions out there. Uh, they're watching uh, the Sunday night football game or they're uh, playing board games or more than one are enjoying some adult beverages. It is a, a gigantic party on the street. Well, that second year in 2007, January 1st, I slept out on the sidewalk and my family a block and a half away slept at home. And in the morning, my family joined me. And we were with probably five or six other families from the seminary. All of them had children and, and we, we basically um, had saved these seats so that the kids could sit up front and see real well um, the floats that were going by. The adults could stand behind them and keep an eye on the children. I remember eating breakfast. My wonderful wife made me a hot breakfast and, and brought it down to the parade route. And I remember um, having the hugs and kisses with my two children at the time, Andrea, who was three, and Landon, who was two years old. And I specifically remember having a conversation with Landon that morning. He was only two, and he was a curious little guy, and um, he wanted to know what was going on, why the police officers were out there for, for the safety, and and you know the the police cars that would go by um, every once in a while because something crazy was going on a couple blocks away uh, he wanted to know uh, different things about people that were in the crowd these crowds by the way are absolutely immense uh, oftentimes they fill up the entire sidewalk and these sidewalks are not one lane sidewalks just like most of the LA region you have lots and lots of lanes if you will and so oftentimes the sidewalks are filled with people 15 to 20 people deep watching the parade well I had this conversation with Landon and I, I sat him back down in his little fold-up chair and I went back to stand with my wife, but to do so I had to walk a couple of feet down the street and then through a little opening and then I had to say excuse me a million times to get to my spot. And in that brief little moment of time, the couple of seconds it took me to do that, all of a sudden Landon disappeared. When I got to my seat, I looked out in front of me and Landon wasn't there and so I turned to Heidi and I said, do you know where Landon is? And Heidi said, no, I thought he was with you. And I said, he was just with me, but I don't see him right now. And suddenly, panic gripped us. Real panic. If you're a parent, you know what this is like. We looked all over the place in the immediate area, amongst our friends, out into the street, because the parade hadn't started yet. And then we started to wander the street. As the second seconds ticked away, I got this really ill feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I had this thought that even to this day makes me sick. If our little boy Landon wandered away, then most likely we'll find him because there were lots and lots of volunteers and lots of police officers. Somebody would notice him. But if somebody took him, they could have snuck out any side street and we would never see our boy again. I started down the street one way, my wife the other way. Many of the parents joined in the search that we came with. We couldn't find land. It felt like it was 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, but in reality, two minutes went by. I remember approaching a police officer and I started into my story that we lost our boy. And so he said to me, can you tell me a description of your boy? What does he look like? And I just started to say what he looked like when I heard a police officer call over the radio. We have a little boy, he's lost, and he has red hair. I didn't know for sure that that was our boy Landon, 
But in Southern California, where Latinos and uh, Mexican folks are, are the most populous uh, group of people, and most of them have dark hair, a little red boy was a bit of an anomaly. And a couple seconds later, a police officer walked our boy down to this other police officer and he ran into my arms and I just embraced him and I, I said, Land, and I love you. The thought crossed my mind to say, why did you wander away? Where did you go? Why did you put us in such a panic? But I loved him so much. I still love him so much. That I just wrapped my arms around him and hugged him and held him close. I never wanted to let go of him again. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Maybe you've lost one of your children in a department store or outdoors. And, and it feels like an eternity until you find them. I believe this is the Easter story. But let me explain it perhaps in a story that you've already heard. You know, this year is, is different because we have to stay home. We can't go to the church building to worship on Easter Sunday. It's probably the first time many of us have experienced this since we have become Christians. And yet, a lot of things haven't changed. In fact, the most important thing hasn't changed. The real focus of Easter is not in the dresses that we wear or the new suit or tie that we're put, we've put on. It's not in the family pictures that we uh, have somebody else at church take for us. It's not in the Easter bunny. It's not in the Easter eggs or the Easter baskets that we find. It's in the fact that Jesus Christ came to save the world, that he conquered death. And so we have to go back to that time, the time of Jesus, when he walked the face of the earth to understand what's going on. The disciples did not expect Jesus to rise from the dead. On Good Friday, we talked about what they experienced. They didn't expect him to die either. In fact, we can actually read earlier in the gospel passages about Peter saying, I will not let you die. I will fight to the last to protect you, Jesus. And Jesus tells him, you do not have the, the mind of God. Get behind me because you are not thinking in the ways of God. And despite the fact that Jesus tells his disciples many, many times, that he is going to die and rise from the dead three days later. They don't understand. It doesn't fit with their understanding of who the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is supposed to be. And in fact, we can probably relate with what they were experiencing on that Easter Sunday morning. Because they were in lockdown mode. They were holed up in a house together because if they ventured out, and one of the Jewish officials or even the, the Roman soldiers saw them, they would have been arrested and probably crucified themselves because they were the ones that had followed Jesus around. There were three days of importance as it related to Jesus' death and his resurrection. Friday, that was the day that Jesus was arrested and he was tried and he was convicted and hung on a cross. And you might recall from the Good Friday service that two men took Jesus' body off of the cross after he was dead. And they had to hurry to get Jesus buried quickly because the Sabbath day was about to start. And they didn't want to be unclean for the Sabbath day. And coming in contact with a dead body made you unclean in the Jewish world. Furthermore, you weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath day. And Jews, their days were different than our days. We tend to think of our days starting at 12.01 a.m. and ending at midnight. In the Jewish world, the day ended at sundown or sunset and started at sunset. And so Friday ended 
at sunset, and Saturday stretched on what, what would have seemed, I believe, for them forever, as they mauled over in their minds what it might mean that their, their Jewish rabbi, Jesus Christ, had been taken from them, that they had been duped, that they were now hiding for their very lives. I'm sure as all of us have experienced the loss of loved ones, they burst into tears throughout the day, only to console themselves that it would all be okay. And on Sunday morning, as the sun came up, a new week had dawned. The beginning of what the disciples would have believed to be the longest week of their lives, I'm sure. And that's where we pick up the Easter story that you probably know. So if you have a Bible, turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. That is the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. And we're going to start in the first verse. And notice who the people are that are going to the tomb on that day. Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord for us on this Easter Sunday. What's going on here? The women are on their way to the tomb, and they're carrying spices because they want to place them on Jesus' dead body. It was the honorable thing to do, to pay respects for the loved one that has passed away. And when they get to the tomb, they are in for a real surprise. Because the stone that was put in place to seal this uh, tomb, this cave, has been rolled away, and Jesus' body is no longer there. They had to be beyond confused about what was going on. And then to make matters worse, two men that are gleaming like lightning show up. And the women hit the deck. They're fearful, and they don't know what to do. But the two men tell them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus is risen from the dead. He already told you this. And the women accept this teaching, remembering what Jesus said. But when they go back to the disciples, how did the disciples respond? Hooray, it's over. We get to celebrate. We, we get it. We're out of the lockdown mode. We can go try to find Jesus Christ. No, that is not the response. Peter sneaks out and goes to investigate himself. And all he finds in the tomb are the strips of linen that had been wrapped around Jesus at his burial. Later, Jesus will show up and give testimony of the fact that he's risen from the dead. On one occasion, he does this, and Thomas is not there, one of the disciples. And when the, others, the other disciples report to Thomas that Jesus has actually shown up 
physically before them. Thomas says, I will not believe until I can see him myself. I want to see the wounds that are on his body. I want to know for myself. I want to see him for myself. And Jesus actually comes before Thomas and he tells him to stop doubting. And Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. He gets it. He realizes that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Easter is the story about separation. It's the story about separation in time. From Good Friday until Easter. From that fateful Friday until that glorious Sunday. It is the separation of time. I like to say that a day can seem like an eternity, but a year goes by quickly. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm saying. Some days it feels like things will never end. And yet, every year, whether it's our birthday that marks it, or the new year, or, or, or our anniversary if we're married, or the end of the school year, or the start of a new one, a year clicks by over and over and over again. But for those three days for the disciples, time stood still. It's as though eternity stopped. But this separation that takes place at Easter is not just about time. It's also about our separation from God. The brokenness that we call sin that separates us from God is real. And God, who made the rule book, says that the wages of sin is death. That what we deserve for our sin is to die. And yet, in the fullness of time, so many years ago, God sent Jesus Christ to the face of the earth to live a perfect life and then to die as a sacrificial lamb on the cross, only to rise from the dead three days later so that we, if we believe in Jesus Christ, can be right with God. That's what happened so many years ago. And that's what happened in 2007 when I found my boy who was lost. See, there was nothing I could do except search for him. I wasn't even the one that found him. It was others. But I had a choice to make when he was found. To pass judgment on him or to embrace him, to receive him. And the most natural thing of all was to hug him, and kiss him, and love him, and hold him tight. And that's how God feels about us today. No matter what is in your past. Because you know, that day in Pasadena, I wasn't a perfect father, and my son wasn't a perfect child. And neither of us are to this day. And if, if we could figure it out, how much more a heavenly Father who is perfect, who gives us a gift freely in Jesus Christ and holds it out for all of us to say, I have the answer to your sin problem. Just ask me into your life. Allow me to be Lord and Savior of you. You might say, well, that sounds good, but that's kind of an emotional thing. Maybe it's just an emotional response to, to a story. But there are real rational and plausible reasons to believe that Jesus Christ, in fact, did what the Bible says that He did. I'll give you just a couple, but there are so many that we could spend hours defending the facts that substantiate Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. First of all, the chief witnesses 
to Jesus' resurrection, at least at first, are women. And in the first century, although many of us wouldn't like this today, women's testimony was not as valued as men. So if, in fact, you were trying to convince people of something that wasn't true, you certainly wouldn't use women as your primary first witnesses. The disciples who, to a T, go into hiding and try to preserve their lives after Jesus is arrested. All except one we know of, that was John, gave up their lives because of their belief in Jesus Christ. They willingly later gave up their lives as martyrs. No sane person will do that if they know that what they're standing up for and what they're teaching is false. In Matthew chapter 28, it actually says that the disciples gather around Jesus and they worship Him after the resurrection. But it also says this, but some doubted. Why would you include things like that if you're trying to substantiate the story that we know as the Easter Passion? Again, we have to recognize how this situation would have not only overturned and, and made a complete chaos of the disciples' theology, their understanding of God, it also would have turned their world completely upside down. They did not believe that a Messiah would come in such a way. They didn't believe that the Messiah would have to rise from the dead. They didn't even believe that the Messiah would die. And so, literally, on a daily basis, their world is being turned upside down. And the only real rational explanation for this is the fact that it took place. In addition to this, you have lots and lots of people, millions of people, who have had personal encounters with Jesus Christ. Some have taken to write down their accounts in books. Uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven is probably the most popular one in the last decade or so. Also, Heaven is for Real, the story of um, a little boy who had a near-death experience. But they don't always take on that radical of a form. There are many, many people that you can talk to to this day that have had encounters with Jesus Christ. And further, if in fact the story of Easter was a big ruse, it was a bunch of fakery, when the Gospel writers took the time to write down the events as they occurred, many people would have still been alive to discount them if they were not true. And yet, we don't see this taking place. Again, this is just... Uh, a, a few of the examples of reasons why we can rationally believe that the Easter story in fact takes place as the Bible says. And so I'm challenging you to respond in one of three ways today, depending upon your situation. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and to deal with your sin problem, if you recognize the separation that occurs between you and God, I ask you to humble yourself, and if the Holy Spirit is prompting you in your heart, to tell God that you need Jesus. It's simple to do that, but it, it should be sincere. And you can put it in your own words, but include these things. Admit that you are a sinner. And we understand from the scripture that the wages of sin is death, meaning that because of our sin, we're separated from God eternally, unless something has been done. And that something has been done in the person of Jesus Christ, who was fully human and fully God. And he conquered death by rising from the dead. He also paid our debt for sin, as a sacrifice on the cross. And so believe that Jesus Christ is in fact who He says He is. 
and then walk in the ways of Jesus Christ all the days of your life. It's not just about getting to heaven. It's about being connected to God here and now, every single day as we walk around the face of the earth, in our thoughts, in our relationships, in the problems we encounter, in the rejoicing um, that we get to experience, in the celebrations that we get to take part in, in all of our lives. There's a second group of people that I want to speak to. Perhaps you're beginning to ask some hard questions in your life, but you're not fully convinced that Jesus is who he said he was. You're not willing to take the plunge today. And I have a challenge for you, and I call it the 30-day challenge. One month. You know, if we have a little bit of extra flab on our bellies, we'll try something for 30 days to see if it works to, to get rid of it. If we have a bad habit, we'll try something for a month and see if we can rid ourselves of that bad habit. I'm challenging you to engage in 30 days of really exploring and asking God to reveal Himself to you. And the best way that you can help enable that to take place is to read the Bible. And I specifically challenge you to read the Gospel of John. There are 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. So if you read one chapter each day, you still have extra time left over in your 30 days to go back and re-examine the claims that Jesus Christ makes. I also challenge you to talk to God. Pray to Him. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just be honest. And I challenge you in 30 days that if you seek God, I trust, not that He's a magic genie and He has to fit into our timeline, but I trust that God will show Himself to be real in your life if you truly want to seek Him and find Him. And finally, if you already are a Christian and you've committed your life to Jesus Christ and you have the gift of salvation, take it upon yourself this week to reach out to somebody you know doesn't believe and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Tell them a story like I told you a story in my life that they may understand that helps to illustrate what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. Easter is special because of what Jesus Christ did. I pray that not only today, but the rest of your life, and all the way into eternity, you would know Jesus Christ personally and walk with Him and be obedient to Him that you might be able to experience the goodness of all that God has in store for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways that you illustrate your love for us in our own lives. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in the faith that you would make them bold and loving and sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with others. I pray for those who have prayed the first time today to invite you into their lives. And I pray that you would help them to be able to tell somebody that they know is a Christian so that they can grow. You can even comment below on this uh, YouTube channel and we'll help find resources for you. Lord, I pray for those people that are still exploring who you are and the claims that Jesus Christ makes. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them so that they, so that they unmistakably know that you are real. Lord, in all things, may you be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we will see you next Sunday, if not before, via technology. We look forward to the time that we can be together and worship in person yet again. 
And in the meantime, make the most of the quiet moments that you've been given to grow in your relationship with God. God bless you.